Today, I realize that there are many believers, and some of you here today, that have met God, but there are some that don't know God. Even though you may have met him, even though you may have received Jesus Christ into your heart, there are many who have not pursued a relationship with him. And because of this, they've never gotten to know who God is. See, the Bible is full of verses that reveal the access that we have to God. God gives us an access to him. And the that access has been made through the, and it's made available to us through what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Because Jesus loved us enough to lay down his life, to come out of heaven, first of all, and take on the form of man, then to lay down his life for our redemption and pay for it with his precious blood, it's given us a provision that we can know him. And we can know his Father who is in heaven. God's purpose for his children, and his only purpose is for his children, is that we move into fellowship with him after we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. You see, it was never intended for us just to meet Jesus and not have a personal relationship with him and his Father. I'm shocked at how many people today run around the world talking about, oh yeah, I know Jesus, Jesus this, Jesus that. You know about Jesus, but do you really know him? You see, there have been thousands and thousands of books written about God, sharing some measure of who he is or some attribute that he has. You can read books by great ministers, great authors, and you can glean from them what they've learned about God. Or you can study their lives and get some insights to what God is like, because you know, I love studying autobiographies and biographies of people and find out ooh, what God did in their lives. And you can learn a little bit about what God did in someone else's life. But this is the approach, in fact, that many have been taking in trying to find out who God is. We read about other people's experiences. We read about other people's interpretation of truth. We read other people's writings. And this has somehow created a problem in theology. The church is focused on studying about God than, rather than study of God. Amen. There are Christians that can tell me about God, but they don't know God. The religion I grew up in. I went to seminary to study about God. I knew all about God. I could even give you my catechism backwards and forwards. But I never knew God. We call the study of God or about God theology. And this is taught throughout our seminaries and through our Bible schools all over the world. Believers study the Bible as well as other books that are written by men and women of God to see what they have to say about God. But I believe that we've missed the most important thing, which is a personal individual study of God ourselves. God intends for us to get to know him through a personal relationship with him. One of the things that's being fought about and fought against in our world today by leading people in the church and outside of the church is that you can have a personal relationship with God. That you can have a personal relationship with a personal Savior. In fact, you're going to hear more and more people say, no, 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 it can't be personal. God touches everybody and all religions lead to God. There's a one world religion that people are trying to fashion and form today that basically says that, hey, if you just believe in God, it's okay. But I'm going to tell you that's not true. God never intended this to believe that there was a God. God, believed, God intended for us to have a personal Savior and a personal relationship with that personal Savior. And we must understand that our salvation 
cannot come under the umbrella of another person, another church, another denomination, or another movement. We all stand or we all fall before God by ourselves. You see, it is solely dependent upon our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why I'm very concerned when people are telling you that, hey, you must join my church. I've never asked you to join this church. I'm saying, hey, wait a minute. You join yourself to Christ, and if God has you to share your expression in this church, then we want you here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. Give your Lord a hand. He deserves it. Your relationship and my relationship with God will only develop to the extent that I make an effort to get to know Him personally. It won't come about because of someone else seeking God on your behalf. I am sorry. You are not going to get to know God because a prophet tells you that He'll do something for you. Or because some religion says, all you have to do is believe that there's a God. No. If that were possible, your parents or your pastor would take care of it for you. The truth is, every human being must go to the cross for themselves. You must humble yourself before him. And you must receive Christ's atonement personally. No one can receive it for you. God wants you to know him personally. My personal relationship with God has little benefit for you. Simply because God expects you to experience him for yourself. You can praise God for what you see in my life or in someone else's life. But it's not the same as having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ yourself. It's like being a a spectator at a sporting event. As opposed to being a player in the game. Oh, it's enjoyable watching the game. I enjoy watching some of the games. But it's much more exciting to be involved in actually playing the game. There's much more to lose or to win if you're actually a player. It's the same way in having a relationship with God. Because of what you have invested in developing a personal relationship with God. That relationship is of far greater value to you than the person who observes your life. I've had a lot of people come and say, oh, I wish I knew God as well as you did, Pastor. Then do the same things I did to get to know him. See, it's easy to observe the life of a man or a woman of God. It's easy to observe someone who has a better prayer life or is more spiritual or hears the Bible or sees God in a different way and and to long for that. But you're the spectator. God wants you to get involved and play the game. God wants you to get to know him. And that door is as open to you as it is for any one of us. Do you understand that? A lot of people see merit in other people's relationships with God. But they are unwilling to spend the years that it takes to develop their own relationship. One of the problems that we face today is that we've allowed people to have encounters rather than relationship. There's a lot of teaching today in the body of Christ about how to, how to experience salvation, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, how to how God will manifest in particular situations in your life. This how-to kind of Christianity, kind of almost self-help gospel, gives you ideas of who God is, how he works. And it's not wrong. But the problem is that there are sometimes long spaces of time between the moments where many believers are conscious of God's presence. When they're conscious of God moving in their lives. Oh yes, I remember, I got born again. I love to talk to people about, hey, tell me what God's doing in your life. Well, you know, back in 19, 
92, I gave my life to Jesus. And then in 1998, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And what's been happening since then? Well, you know, I remember I went to one action and I think I heard the voice of God then. Really? You see, if you're living on what happened the day you got born again or the day you were filled with the Spirit, you're living by encounters with God. God never intended just encounters, although they're important and we need those. God intended a relationship day by day, every hour of the day. God wants to have a relationship with you. There's a better way. God intends for us to have experiences with him. And he wants us to enjoy his manifestations. This morning was a perfect example. I don't know when I've ever felt the presence of God quite as sweet as it was in the worship this morning. But there's a big difference between meeting somebody occasionally as opposed to abiding with them continually. You see, throughout each and every day, God wants us to abide with him. If you really want to know somebody, you must spend some time consistently with them instead of having an occasional encounter with them. That's what God planned for us. The closest relationship on earth is between a man and a woman in marriage. Let me tell you something. All you do is meet your wife once a week. You're not going to have a very good marriage. Marriage is two people getting to spend time doing things together, engaging their lives together, raising their families together, working out their ministries, their whatever they do together, really getting to know each other at the deepest level of relationship. Yet the Lord himself knows us much more deeply than this. The Bible says he knows our thoughts and the intents of our hearts at all times. How many of you know that our hearts are totally exposed to God at all times, whether we want them to be or not? It is possible for you and I to close the door of our spirit to people, but no one can hide their heart from God. When we choose to open our heart to God and seek a relationship with him, you're going to find out that God will also begin to open his heart to you. This is the first step in developing a relationship that goes much deeper than our initial encounter with him. One of the dangers of the church today is that as God moves in churches and believers are enjoying the manifestations of his spirit, one of the dangers is that many people begin to enjoy the presence of God, but these are spasmodic experiences, and rather than seeking an ongoing relationship with him, they just seek the experience with him. That's why so many people church shop, hop, chop, and flop. They can't stick with it because it's not based on a relationship, it's based on the next thing that's happening. Oh, did you hear across town there's a revival? Oh, did you see that there was a miracle in the church down the street? Oh, did you see that there's miracle money taking place in town? And so people are moved, not out of relationship, but they're moved out of an experience. Unfortunately, some believers have made a career of moving from church to church in order to feel the move of the Holy Spirit. They don't take the time to develop a personal relationship with God, and they really don't know him. Running to hear and learn about the experiences of others who've encountered God, from conference to conference, from from man of God to man of God, from one experience to another. Yet they themselves never get to know God, ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth, the Bible says. Not even willing to make any real effort to develop that kind of relationship within themselves. Always hoping that somebody else will be able to do it for them. Tell them, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. But see, 
You have to understand, ever since the beginning, God created us for fellowship with him. In Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that, uh, it talks about how the world was before Adam sinned. How God would come and walk with Adam in the cool of the evening in the garden. And fellowship with him. Talk with him. What a tremendous privilege was lost because of Adam disobeying God. But can I tell you something? Jesus came to pay the price to bridge the gap that separated us from the Father. He came to bring us back into a right relationship with the Father so we could have that fellowship again. He came to remove our sin from us. And once again, open a doorway, an avenue of grace that we can come into the very presence of our Father, which art in heaven, and have fellowship with Him as God originally intended it for it to be. In Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, the Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness of, and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We've been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Everybody say eternal life. Eternal life, that's a powerful word. In 1 John 1, 3, the Bible says, that which we have seen and heard is what we declare to you, that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The reason we declare this is that not so that you can hear what we have tasted and seen and handled of the Word of God and see our fellowship, but not so that you can just see it, so that you can have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. God always wanted you to have fellowship with Him. Here's part of the problem. We have a perverted value system. There's a perverted value system in our world today. And it's crept into the church. We're living in a time when people including believers, seem to be seeking for everything except God. We have placed a high value on things that have little or no real value. We've placed little value on things that are actually priceless. Our whole concept of good and evil have been perverted. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to them! But boy, let me tell you something. That's what this world is today. We lie with impunity. Our newspapers are full of this. Our business people, our politicians, even church members. I was talking to Bishop Vaughn the other day. I was thinking of doing this. All of his church members, he he stays on Facebook so that he can get all of his Facebook pages of all of his church members, and he watches them. (laughs) So he said, hey, just because you're on Facebook, that's open open information, isn't it? So he did a message from his pulpit, and he started putting up people's Facebook pages. (laughs) Why would you be ashamed? You put it all over the Facebook, why would you be ashamed for it to be up in church? The whole world sees it. Why not put it up in church? So he started putting up people's Facebook pages. They're swearing. They're naked bodies. Church people. Oh, they're so holy in church, but all week long, look at who you are. Look how you talk. Look what you Twitter and tweet and whatever you do. So I've been looking at some of your Facebook pages. I thought about doing that message next week. (laughs) You may want to take some of your posts down before next week, okay? (laughs) Uh, Just do 
just look at the neighbor next to you if they're sweating real hard. <laughs> just nudge them say, I know he's not talking about me. But how about you, hey? <laughs> but you see, not only that, but many Christians, many believers have perverted the fear of God. They're distrustful of him. They blame him for just about every negative thing that happens in their lives. I'm really shocked at how many people, something bad happens, they say, well, you know, God takes the best. What? Little boy died the other day, and uh, I guess God needed another flower from, what? God is not the author of death. The thief comes to rob, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. But it's so easy to get confused. And I hear Christians blaming God, afraid of God. Every negative thing that happens in their life, well, I, I, whatever it will be, will be. God must have known. They seem to think that God is waiting for some kind of opportunity to judge them harshly every time they make a mistake. At the same time, everything good in our lives, we're sure quick to take credit for it. Yeah, I'm smart. We neglect to give God glory for the good things that we enjoy in our everyday lives. But then on the other hand, we also give the devil credit or blame for character flaws that actually are the manifestations of our own selfishness, our own rebellious natures. And then when you do that, you're actually elevating him to a realm that he shouldn't have. Oh, the devil made me do it. Well, you know how the devil is. You know, I just, no, that's you. It's not the devil, it's you. It's your flesh. It's your selfishness. You did that, not the devil. Don't give him that much power. You chose that. Well, the devil tempted me. No, you were tempted by your own lusts. That's what the Bible says. Your own flesh. Then we deny the power of God through our unbelief. While at the same time, we elevate ourselves as if we somehow have control over our lives and our future. This is the foundation of humanism. And unfortunately, this deception is running rampant amongst believers. The concept that somehow you can control your destiny and that you can evolve enough spiritually to make right choices and to run your own life, that's a lie from Satan. God didn't ever create you to become so spiritual that you can run your own life. He always created us to have fellowship with him and talk to him about everything, have a relationship with him where he would guide us and direct us and help us and love us and nurture us and, and walk with us. He never wanted us to walk alone. We walk together with God. Amen. This teaching that says somehow you can become smart enough, become spiritual enough that you can control your destiny is a lie. It's humanism. It's, it's part of Gnosticism. That somehow you can get enough knowledge that you're smart enough to be God of your own world, of your own empire. It's not true. You see, whenever you move outside of Christ, it really doesn't matter what you accomplish. Because it has no real value. Oh, it may have temporal benefits. Temporal meaning benefits on earth. Temporary benefits. But it absolutely has no eternal value. Romans, 8, Romans 7 and verse 18 says this. For I know, this is Paul speaking, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. The Amplified Version says, I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. Our flesh is totally sinful. But Christ in us is the hope of glory. You know, I am watching a lot of churches around the world today, and I'm watching a lot of people that are giving a lot of messages today. And I want to bring a warning, because today it seems like success seems to be the theme that people use to justify everything. If it's successful, it must be good. 
If somebody's successful, well then they must be good. But some of the most ungodly people in the world have had the greatest successes. There are many who will lie and cheat and steal to gain success. Now, I'm not saying it's evil to be successful, but making worldly success your goal is a deception. And unfortunately, this has somehow made its way into the church. Even if you obtain it, what do you really have? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? If you've gained everything, at best you've only gained something of temporal value, not eternal. Jeremiah said it this way. Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But listen to this. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. If you're going to glory, let's, uh, let's glory in this, that we understand and know who God is. That we understand and know who he is. We're not to glory in wisdom, might, Riches, might is power, or riches. Yet most of the ambition in this world, even in believers, involves one or all of these categories. People are driven to achieve knowledge and pride themselves on the wisdom that they've attained. Many have built powerful kingdoms on earth to display their might. You see, the carnal nature seeks this kind of power, this kind of control. And don't get me wrong, it's part of the original intention and purpose of God. God said, I give you the power to have rulership and dominion on earth. But it can so quickly have the wrong driving force behind it, the flesh. Satan perverts it and tempts us to seek it from the flesh. Many people try to accumulate riches so that they can be completely independent. Independent wealth, we call it. And that means that we can run our lives and seek anything that our hearts desire. You see, riches give them the power to fulfill all the lusts of their flesh. Yet the Lord says to glory in the fact that you know him, that you understand him. See, God does not intend himself to be unknown. God is not trying to hide himself from his children. The Bible says he is the light. How do you hide light? Jesus' works were never done in secret. He spoke very clearly about what he was doing. He spoke very clearly about his purposes for our lives. God wants us to know him. He wants us to understand him because he's our father. When God allows you to go through testings or trials, even temptations, I want you to know something. He's not trying to make you miserable. Just tell your neighbor, he's not trying to make you miserable. Often what God is trying to do is he's trying to prove your heart to see if you trust him enough to obey him, whether you understand what he's doing or not. And then if you do obey him, it's amazing. He begins to give you understanding of what he's doing. And he'll move you from being a servant to becoming a friend. Many people are still servants of God. They haven't become friends of God. You see, the disciples were with Jesus throughout his whole ministry. They saw the multitudes come and they saw them go. The Bible says because of Jesus' hard sayings. How would you have liked to follow Jesus and one day Jesus gets up and he gives a sermon? We find this sermon in Matthew chapter 6 or in, in, in uh, I think, or John, John chapter 6. Uh, John chapter 6. And, he, and he, uh, he gives this sermon and he talks about 
If you have any part of me, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> and it says the multitudes left. They're all gone. <laughs> Woo, this is a hard saying. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Peter and the 12, he says, are you going to leave me too? John 6, 67, it was Peter who answered. It says, then Jesus said unto the 12, will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Everybody say eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. Where do we go? I don't know where else to go. There's nowhere else to go. I, I, I'm into this thing. I'm committed to you, Jesus. You have the words of eternal life. After a time of walking with Jesus, he called his disciples together, and he began to call them friends instead of servants because they had done whatever he had commanded. The Bible says in John 15, verses 14 and 15, you want to see this. I would underline it about 10 times in my Bible. He says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. See, a servant doesn't know or understand what his master is doing. I mean, I don't sit down and tell everybody that works for me what I'm doing. Now, here's why I do this, and here's what I'm asking you to do so you know, because there's the big picture, and if you do this, and, no. Sometimes I just tell people, just do this. Here, I'm paying you to do this, just do this. A servant, sometimes an employee, he just, he just do the job. But your friend, you take time and you show him. A servant doesn't know. He doesn't understand what his master is doing. But a master explains his motives to his friends. You see, we don't get to understand about what God is doing when we first begin to serve him. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. It just doesn't work that way. You begin spending time with him. Then you begin obeying him. And the Bible says if you love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments. John 14, 15, if we love, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. But then jump down to John 14, 23. Look what it says there. Jesus answered and said to him, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Amen. See, if you love God, you keep his commandments. But later on, he says, hey, if you love me and obey me, he says, not only will... I come to you, but my Father will come and we'll make our dwelling place with you. We'll hang out with you. We'll become friends. Some of you want the friendship without the obedience. Some of you want the friendship without going the servant route, saying, Lord, hey, I'm going to trust you. Now, these are hard sayings, Lord. Yeah, he says they are. They're hard sayings. Will you get, are you going to leave me too? Just look at that. If you do this, then the Father and the Son will make their dwelling place with you. I want you to know something. When God is abiding with you, you'll get to know him. You'll get to know him. You'll become better acquainted with him. And he'll begin to manifest his life through your life. Then after a season of walking and communing with God. He'll begin to explain some things to you. He'll begin to say, wait, 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 come here, let me, let me, let me, and he'll start showing you secrets. He'll start elevating you to the position of a friend. As God begins to see the faithfulness of your heart, he begins to trust you with more information about his kingdom. Amen. He'll begin to show you why he does certain things, the way he does them. See, many times, God requires his children to do or to be something other than what many Christians think they should be. There's times I've had to do things and I've offended some of my Christian brothers and sisters knowing that God told me to do something. 
But I offended them because they couldn't understand God's purposes in a matter. You see, if you observe God from a distance, it sometimes appears that God does illogical things. But when you get to know him, you'll see that everything he does is perfect in every way. You know, one of, one of the things I learned about watching my, my wife is that she has an uncanny ability to hear God in certain areas. And she's close to God. Sometimes when you hear what she has to say, it's like, <laughs> I'm not sure I even want to go there. Because if you're far from God, or if you're not listening to God in that area, it sounds illogical. Amen, Sister Bonnie? <laughs> Let me just talk for a minute about some things that we need to look at. If we're going to walk with God, we're going to really need to have some scriptural foundations in our lives. You see, the world is moving away from the Bible and moving into a self-help gospel. Five principles to make you a better person. Seven things that will make you successful. Eight steps to the overcoming lifestyle. Nine steps to finding the God in you. And it all sounds wonderful. But I've read a few of the books that have come out recently by leading luminaries in the body of Christ, and they're very lightweight on the Word of God. Very lightweight. One or two scriptures woven together, twisted to make it sound wonderful, but not much God. A lot of self help. You see, we have to have a scriptural foundation for anything that we try to appropriate in our relationship with God. And there are foundational truths that are available to you and I, to every child of God, every moment and the minute you come into the kingdom of God. But these truths have some basic requirements. First of all, you have to know who you are. Secondly, you have to know what God expects of you. And third, you must know what kind of relationship God has made available to you. If you don't understand that, you're going to get lost. Many people don't know who they are. They don't know what God has for them, and they don't know what, what God's made available to them. And so they're looking everywhere except where God told them to look. In John chapter 17... Jesus prayed his apostolic prayer for his disciples. This was just before he was arrested, just before he was taken to the cross. Now, if there's a verse of scripture that you should, be, that you should pray and that you should read every day of your life, or at least regularly, it's John 17. John 17 is our high priest's prayer, Jesus the righteous, that he prayed for you and me. In John 17, 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, his own disciples, but, for, but also for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So Jesus prayed this prayer for you and me. Did you get that? That's a, that's a pretty deep prayer there, eh? So let's just look at John 17, verses 1 through 3. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And said, Father, the hour is come, glorify your Son, that thy Son may also glorify you, as you have given power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, everybody say eternal life, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now listen to this. And this is eternal life. Everybody say eternal life. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What is eternal life? 
walking down an aisle and raising your hand in church? That's the beginning, maybe. But eternal life isn't what you did on a Sunday. It's to know him and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. God wants you to have eternal life, and eternal life is knowing him. A relationship, not a transaction. The transaction may have got things started, but it's the relationship, the intimate knowledge of him that's important. You see, when a person accepts redemption through Jesus the Christ, you're given the opportunity to receive eternal life. What does this really mean? John 17 verse 3 defines this eternal life as the ability to know God and to know his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent. The essence of eternal life has been made available to every one of God's children. Each of us can know God personally rather than know about him. Some of you will settle to know about him. You'll come to church and hear a sermon and say, well, that was interesting. We'll hear more next week. I don't preach to tell you about him. I preach to make you hungry to know him. Amen. You know, I don't know about you, but I used to think that eternal life meant that I would never die. I'm going to live eternally. Well, but the word of God already reveals that human beings are born with eternal spirits and will never die, regardless if they get saved or not. Every spirit that has been created will either spend its eternity in the presence of God or in the lake of fire, depending on the choice that each person makes, whether or not to accept or reject Christ. It's amazing to know that eternal life means that I can know the Father and His Son personally. That's eternal life, to know Him and His Son personally. I get to know them. The word know, here in this verse, is defined in the original Greek as to know absolutely in a great variety of applications with many implications, as to follow. It means to allow, to be aware of, to feel, to have known or knowledge of, to perceive, to be resolved, can speak of, be sure of, and to understand. It's compared to the word new, to, that, 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 where, where in, in Genesis 4 verse 1 it says, and God said, Adam knew Eve and conceived a child. To know and to knew basically mean to know someone in a variety of ways. By experiencing intimacy, which is the result of spending quality time together, much the same way as a husband and a wife would come to know each other. It results from both persons sharing with each other from their hearts rather than from their minds. You know, you can, you can kind of compare eternal life to being born into a natural family. You know, your home, your home, the food on the table, shelter, are part of the package. I mean, all my kids know that, hey, they can always come home. There's always a, 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 a roof over their heads. There's food on the table. There's always going to be probably a car to drive. There's, there's a hot bath, warm bed. That, that's just part of the deal. You're, you're a Duchelle. Okay, so guess what? You get to, that's just part of the family relationship. But the real basis for family is the love and the fellowship enjoyed by the members who begin to share their personal relationships with each other. See, if that ever breaks down, that we can't share our personal relationships, then you really don't have family. You just have kind of an existence. That's why families take a lot of hard work. You're constantly having to break those things down so you can keep your hearts open to each other. 
The same with God, your relationship with him. You see, I don't know, can you get a glimpse of how magnificent it is to be a child of the almighty God? Just a glimpse. Can you just see what it might be like? I'm a child of God. You see, our heavenly father has given us eternal life. We've been born into a family, a family of God. God is the creator of the universe. Let's get who he is right. Not only is he the creator of the universe, he's the creator of everything else that exists as well, including you and I. He owns the earth, and he owns all that is in it. Yet he's given us the gift of eternal life so we can know him. It amazes me that so many Christians have never availed themselves to the invitation. Many are too busy with their careers. They don't have time for God. They'd rather watch television, read a book, or go to a movie. Or something else that just consumes their time. Be on Facebook. Acts 17 verse 28 says... For in him we live and move and have our being. Paul was comparing Christianity to a fallen religion. He was talking about false gods. But he referred back and said, hey, but in him we live, we move, and we have our being. We know that our life in Christ is everything. Everything that has value is found in him and him alone. And yet so few believers really accept this truth. We don't seem to realize how awesome the privilege is of knowing God. One last story. In the book of Genesis, there's a man named Enoch. The Bible says, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. Now Methuselah became the oldest man in the Bible. The day Methuselah died, Noah went into the ark, and judgment began. But the Bible says about Enoch, and he says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah for 300 years. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Verse 24 of Genesis 5 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I don't know, I find that we have some believers in the church that find it hard to keep it straight for two or three days, let alone 300 years. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Here's what I want you to know. There's no reason why we cannot walk with God the same way Enoch did. If Enoch could walk with God, we can walk with God. God has made eternal life available to all of us. He wants us to have fellowship with him. He wants to have fellowship with us. At the same time, he wants to prepare you and I to rule and to reign with him during the millennial reign and then for eternity to come. Revelations 2, verses 26 and 27 in the Amplified Bible, it says... And he who overcomes, that is, who's victorious, and who obeys my commands to the very end, doing the works that please me, I will give him authority and power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a scepter or a rod of iron, as when earthen vessels or pots are broken in pieces. And his power over them shall be like that which I myself have received of my Father. We're co-heirs. God says, I want you to have exactly what I have. He says, but you need to obey me. You need to have fellowship with me. You have to have a relationship with me. There is a future that is available to believers that is beyond our comprehension. We only have a short time to prepare for eternity. It's, a, it's very crucial that we get to know and understand our Father. Because our eternity is based upon our relationship that we develop with him while we're on earth. The door's open. 
The door's wide open. He says that we can come before the throne of grace at any time. The Son made a way for us to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. Hebrews 4.16. It's only by grace that we will spe- that, that he can speak to us. And that we have fellowship with us. So, on the one hand, it's by grace. But on the other, it's by faith. By grace, we have access to him. But by faith, Hebrews 11.6 says, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 